Let us pray. Oh God, we know you are near. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you, O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So there's three men marooned on a desert island with no hope of getting off the island. They're wandering around aimlessly, and, and one guy just all of a sudden trips on something and, and realizes it's a lamp. And he rubs the lamp, and a genie pops out and gives each of the men one wish. Well, the first man says, I, I gotta get back to my company in Toronto. I gotta get back to my work. Poof, he's gone. The second man says, I really wish my fa I was with my family. Please let me go back to my family. Poof, he's gone. And the third man stands there, looks around and says, I feel so lonely. I, I wish my friends were back here with me. <laughs> The guy's a few peas short of a casserole, if you know what I mean. <laughs> well, this morning we're talking about somebody who wasn't. King Solomon was known as the wisest king in all of Israel. King Solomon achieved some amazing things in his life. He is known for writing the Proverbs, or at least collecting all the Proverbs in the, the book of Proverbs, collecting these wise sayings. He's known for all sorts of wise uh, acts and leading the people with uh, great judgment. But he's known probably best of all for building the temple. And you would think that perhaps the reason Solomon was able to do this was that he had all sorts of kind of lucky breaks. I mean, he was a king after all. He probably had all sorts of money and stuff as, at his disposal. But that's not the case. Solomon faced obstacles. And it was because of his unique approach that he was able to achieve these great things. I think that those of us who gather, those of us who continue to be the church today, those of us who have any kind of struggles or things we want to achieve in life can look to Solomon, can look to the lessons of Solomon and learn something from him. Part of the reason that Solomon was successful was that he started with defeat. Solomon started with weakness which is just the opposite of what you'd expect today. Today, if you, you know, anybody who tells you how to do a New Year's resolution or, you know, if you make a goal that you want to lose weight or, I don't know, run a marathon or, or some lofty big go back to school goal, they tell you, they tell you, okay, now what you want to do is start with victory. What you want to do is start by visualizing the finish line, whatever that finish lo line looks like. You want to start with like a, a can-do attitude. And that's what you'd think that Solomon had, you know, one of those attitudes that's like a yes sir, how high sir kind of attitude, right? Except that Solomon starts with the opposite. He almost starts with a can't do attitude. In fact, if you look through the Bible, this is a theme that you'll see over and over again. The people of God who do amazing things for God seem to start with defeat. There's something we can learn for this. For Solomon and God's chosen people, building the temple, building a place where the presence of God, where God would dwell, was, well, it was foolishness. How could anyone build something on earth that could possibly contain, even a little bit, contain the God of the heavens and the earth. Solomon said in Second Chronicles, but who is able to build him a house since heaven, even highest heaven, cannot contain him? Who am I to build a house for him except as a place to make offerings before him? So Solomon begins this challenge of a lifetime, this challenge to build the temple by being very aware 
of his limitations by being aware that he can't possibly do this. And I think that's significant for us to remember. Why do you want to start there? Because when you start in weakness, when you start with your limitations, when you start in defeat, then you know that you can't do it alone. One of the first things Solomon does after he becomes king is he goes to Gideon, not the person, but this is now the place. He goes to Gideon and uh, he seeks God's presence. And in the night, God says to him, ask me for anything and I will give it to you. That's quite something. What is even more something is he doesn't ask to win the Powerball. That was something this week, eh? $1.5 billion. I heard that the odds of winning that were, were, uh, were you were better, you had better odds to have identical quadruplets twice than you were to win the Powerball. <laughs> anyway, three people did win it. But, but that's not what Solomon asks for. He doesn't ask for wealth. He doesn't ask for security. He doesn't ask for, for health. He asks for wisdom, exactly. He says, Lord God, I'm your servant. You've made me king in my father's place, but I'm very young and know so little about being a, lawyer, a, a leader. And now I must rule your chosen people, even though they are too, there are too many of them to count. Please make me wise and teach me the difference between right and wrong. Then." I will know how to rule your people. If you don't, there's no way I could rule this great nation of yours. So God, so Solomon seeks God's help. And then, because he's aware of his limitations, he seeks the help of others. He goes to King Huram of Tyre and asks him to bring all sorts of goods to him. So now send me an artisan skilled to work in gold, silver, bronze, and iron, and in purple, crimson, and blue fabrics, trained also in graving to join the skilled workers who are with me in Judah and Jerusalem, whom my father provided. The truth is, life is too difficult to live alone. I think it's one of our greatest weaknesses in this day and age and in, uh, in where we live. We're too isolated. We're not connected enough to one another. We like to go it alone. We don't see our neighbors often enough. It's one of the biggest differences I noticed between Canada and times when I have visited in Kenya or, or Zambia. Those are places where there's tremendous difficulties, tremendous hardships, and yet the people go together. When someone dies, the whole community gathers in their house and they sing all night long. The community is connected to one another. I don't know about you, but I have a hard time sometimes asking for help. I don't know why, perhaps it feels like weakness. But if God gives you a task, or if life has placed some big challenge in front of you, the odds are good that it would be almost impossible to achieve alone. And if it is possible to achieve it on your own, it's infinitely better when we draw on other people to help us, when we gather with others to help us. That's one of our goals here at the church, to connect people to God and to connect people to each other. That's why we do the GNIP. You know what the GNIP is, right? <laughs> the GNIP is the go now in peace. <laughs> when we hold hands and sing the go now in peace, it's a symbol of being connected to one another. It's just a symbol, and we need to go deeper and farther with connecting ourselves, connecting to lonely people in the community. But that's why we do that. So Solomon's aware of his limitations. He's aware he can't do this alone. But the other key thing about Solomon is he doesn't get stuck there. It would be easy to get stuck 
in the overwhelmingness of what lies ahead and give up and say there's no way I can do this and get you know just sort of depressed and down in the dumps and I know that's what the enemy would dearly love you to do when faced with something amazing that God wants you to do or when faced with a life challenge that's put on your plate just to, to give up and to give in but Solomon steps out anyway Solomon steps out in courage his father King David tells him how he is to build the temple and he says be strong and of good courage and act do not be afraid or dismayed for the Lord God my God is with you he will not fail you or forsake you until all the work for the service of the house of the Lord is finished he does not get stuck in his smallness or his limitation he takes a step forward and acts do you remember that great the morning prayer I know you've heard it dear Lord so far I've done all right I haven't gossiped I haven't lost my temper haven't been greedy grumpy nasty selfish or overindulgent and I'm really glad about that but in a few minutes God I'm gonna get out of bed and from then on I'm gonna need all the help I can get the point is no matter how overwhelming your day is you gotta get out of bed you need to ask for God's help but you have to get out of bed you need to take that first step and have the courage to do what needs to be done a few years ago Jim Collins wrote uh, an amazing book called good to great and it it was it's about companies it's about companies that make a leap from being good companies to being great companies and his whole kind of thesis is that uh, it wasn't again it's not not the law of of adversity and challenges that allows a company to go from being mediocre to really great it's a different kind of an attitude um, and in this story he talks about Admiral Jim Stockdale who had been shot down during the Vietnam War and spent eight years in a prisoner camp in Vietnam and these were these were eight brutal years um, Jim Collins interviewed him and he asked him uh, how it is that instead of coming out of that experience broken and defeated that he came out stronger and he Jim Collins asked him who didn't make it in uh, in those camps and Admiral Stockdale answered oh that's easy he said the optimists and Jim Collins was shocked by his answer but he explained that the optimists would cling to uh, would sort of live in denial and cling to a hope that they'd be out by Christmas for sure they'd be out by Christmas but then Christmas would come and go and they'd still be in the camp but then they'd cling to Easter well we'll surely be out by Easter and then Easter would come and go and Thanksgiving and the next Christmas and in the end he said that uh, the optimist bounced from living in the denial of the reality and being stuck in absolute despair N not just being imprisoned by you know the walls that the prisoner camp had imposed on them but also being imprisoned in their spirit in depression in despair uh, Stockdale did another way he faced the reality he faced the brutal reality that was around him but he also held on to a deep faith that he would survive and that not only would he survive but that he would come out of this experience stronger and that in the end he would never trade this experience he said I never lost faith in the end of the story I never doubted not only that I would get out but also that I would prevail in the end and turn the experience into the defining event of my life which in re retrospect I would not trade he said this is a very important lesson you must never confuse faith that you will prevail in the end which you can never afford to lose with the discipline to confront the most brutal facts of your current reality whatever they might be 
One of the things that he did while he was in this prisoner of war camp was that he developed an elaborate internal communication system because their guards often imposed absolute silence on them uh, so that they could not interact with, with one another. So he developed an internal communication system, something like a Morse code. And on the third anniversary, the three years after he had been shot down, uh, they were all out in the yard sweeping and cleaning, and his, his other prisoners were swishing and tapping away, we love you, Stockdale. So they were able to continue to keep up their spirits. He, he did something in the midst of a very difficult time. So Jim Collins, who wrote this Good to Great about companies, says that every company that has made the leap from good to great has an element of this Stockdale um, story to them. What he says is that they don't have fewer times of adversity, but they are willing to face the reality. They're not living in denial. They're willing to face the reality of a changing industry, of a difficult economy, of, of whatever it is, but at the same time, they hold on to an incredible vision of what they, I was going to say, are called to become. That's using Christian language, but of what they want to be on the other hand. That's what we need to do as a church. Solomon was called to build a temple thousands of years ago, but I'm telling you, we are being called to build a new temple today. The way that we have done church for the last couple of thousands of years has, isn't working anymore. And if we don't face the difficult reality, the truth is, as we look around mainline churches today, in your lifetime and in my lifetime, over half of them, maybe more, will be closed in the next 15 to 20 years. You even just look around here. If we were to ask people who were under the age of 65 to put their hands up, you'd have an image right here of what the future starts to look like. In 20 years from now, I wonder how many mainline churches in Brockville will still be open. But the need is just as great. The church, the church of Jesus Christ, will not close but it will change. And Wall Street board members and those who love Wall Street dearly, we need to recognize, not be in denial, but also know with absolute certainty that God wants us to build something new. This temple may not be of bricks and wood. In fact, I would wager it won't be. The temple began as a building to house the presence of God. But then the presence of God came in Jesus, God incarnate. Do you remember when Jesus said, he said and he looked at the temple that Herod had built in his day, he looked at this giant temple in Jerusalem, and he said, destroy that temple, and I will rebuild it in three days. And they looked at him like he was a madman. But of course, he wasn't talking about the bricks and the mortar. He was talking about himself and his death and his resurrection. And when Jesus comes back to life, he sends his Holy Spirit, God's presence, not to a building, but to the people of God, so that the church might be mobile, so that the church might go out and draw people in. We are being called to build a new church in Brockville and in this country and in this world. And we need to have the courage to step out no matter what the reality looks like. I don't know what God is asking you to build. I don't know what hardship life has thrown on your path that seems overwhelmingly difficult. I do know that if we begin on our knees, 
if we begin in seeking God's help, if we have the humility to ask help from others, if we gather together, we will overcome. We will build and experience the presence of God in our lives and in this place. Thanks be to God. Amen.